Hello, and welcome back to the Sinobabble podcast. In today's episode, we're going to be talking about the relationship between China and Russia, specifically the historical relationship from around the end of the Maoist era until the present day. The reason that I wanted to talk about this topic was because, obviously, the question of whether or not China is going to come to Russia's aid in the Ukrainian war is becoming a bit more of a topic in the news, particularly in the last month or so. I wrote about this topic myself in my Substack newsletter, Will China Rescue Russia? So you can click the link in the description below if you want to read that and get my take on that as well. I think something that's often missing from these conversations is sort of a historical perspective, which as to me as a historian is obviously very important. I do understand that in a pressing geopolitical situation, people don't really have time to sit down and discuss the history of international geopolitical relations and things like that. But I do think it provides some context and can help us answer this question of whether China is likely to come to Russia's aid in an actual um, war, not just a cold war. The last time we talked about this topic on the podcast, we spoke about the Sino-Soviet split in a two-part series. The Sino-Soviet split took place from around 1958 to around 1964. And from the Cultural Revolution onwards, Russia and China didn't have any relations whatsoever. They didn't speak to each other. It's not really until nearing the end of the Deng Xiaoping era that you actually get the two opening up communications and talking to each other. So let's go through all the eras up into the current Xi Jinping era and kind of see what we can figure out about whether Russia and China are actually friends and how likely they are to cooperate when it comes to defending or rescuing the other one from a sticky situation. So let's start with the Deng Xiaoping era. It was actually the former Soviet Union that made the first move in restarting bilateral relations. Um, So what happened was Gorbachev sort of reached out to China and agreed that they were going to solve a lot of the border disputes that they were having. Obviously, China and Russia have a really huge land border and also in the east where the sea meets, there's a lot of disputed territory there as well. So in 1986, Gorbachev basically says, hey, when it comes to regions in Afghanistan, Mongolia and eastern Russia, we're willing to kind of recognise the Chinese definitions of the borders or at least come together and discuss them. In 1989, Gorbachev actually visits China and the official talks about how to resolve these issues actually begin. I think it's kind of important to remember, though, that even though this period saw the opening up of communications, It doesn't mean that China really respected Russia or the Soviet Union at all. Um, In fact, Deng Xiaoping was known to have said to his own son that he thought Gorbachev was an idiot and that his policies about opening up politically and socially before opening up economically was a mistake. China sort of sees Gorbachev's political and social policies as a mistake and sees the eventual collapse of the Soviet Union as his fault and as a fate that they want to avoid. That's kind of the tone that's set in the Deng Xiaoping era. But as we move forward and the leaders of both China and the Soviet Union change, there's kind of a change in attitude. As we enter the Jiang Zemin era, so like the 90s, you also have Yeltsin in power in the Soviet, in Russia no longer the Soviet Union, it's now Russia. A way that a lot of the analysts and historians put this forward is that Russia basically had a choice as to whether they wanted to ally themselves with China or with the West. I don't know how much you can construe this as a choice because essentially the West and its allies, such as Japan, weren't really willing to play with Russia. They still viewed Russia with a lot of suspicion and they weren't ready to fully integrate or welcome Russia with open arms into the Eurozone or into kind of the Western trade systems that were going on. In that sense, Russia didn't really have that much choice but to turn to China. As one author writes, the expansion of Western economic and political interests across Eurasia following the collapse of the USSR helped to fuel the China-Russia entente. The evolving economic mercantilism, political populism and authoritarianism, as well as the economic crisis, were strengthening perceptions of political elites in China and Russia that forging further bilateral cooperation was in both nations' national interests. 
A byproduct of this growing connectivity is their increasing anti-Western stance. So I think that point about the anti-Western stance coming into play is very important. So we should kind of put a pin in that because that's a running theme throughout uh, this entire story. Military cooperation and the idea of security come to form very important bases for China and Russia's relations. And the anti-US sentiment, even though it hadn't really reached the point that it is now, it was growing. And this is kind of ironic because the reason for the Sino-Soviet split was because Russia was seen in China's eyes to be growing closer to the US. But in the post-Mao era, Deng Xiaoping was openly making overtures towards the US and had visited the US himself. It's kind of interesting that both countries wanted to be in the US's good books, but also they were getting increasingly more hostile to the West as the West was pushing them out of relations and trade agreements and things like that, and still seeing these two countries as suspicious, especially as China was still communist and is still communist at this time. The two decided to come together. In 1991, they finalised their border treaties, and then in 1996, they came together to agree a strategic cooperation treaty. Now, in this treaty, they said that they wanted to build a partnership based on equality and trust, and they essentially agreed that they would come to take the same stance on all geopolitical situations from then on. And that was in order to build a multipolar world, as opposed to a unipolar world, to prevent a hegemonic domination of any single power, which is obviously a reference to the US. In this period, you also see something called the Shanghai Process kick off, which is where five countries come together and start discussing how they are going to move from sort of hostile border sharers to security friends, basically. So this involves, at this stage, Russia, China, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, and Kazakhstan. This eventually grows into something called the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. It's kind of like a NATO-esque organization but it's less focused on sort of coming to help each other to fight in wars and more about sharing security keeping the peace in the eurasian region and also sharing counterintelligence to stop the spread of things like extremism which has been a problem for all of those countries in that region it's expanded quite a lot i believe india and pakistan are now members and you also have observer member status as well so this is quite an important security pact although as i said it doesn't involve having to actually come to help each other fight which is exactly what we saw in 2014 when none of these countries came to help russia take over crimea and again today none of them are coming to help russia in ukraine in general so There we go. Military cooperation was an important underpinning for Russia and China's cooperation. It made up about 20% of their bilateral trade in the 90s. And the military hardware and software that Russia provided to China was really important at this stage because China had been put under sanctions by Western countries following the Tiananmen Square incident in 1989. So Russia was basically the only method by which China could upgrade its military. And at the same time, Russia needed to keep its military industrial complex growing because that was a very important base of their own economy. And because of the 1992 global financial crisis, it was one of the main things that was, you know, holding up their entire economy. And in this period, you see about 6 billion US dollars worth of trade just on military hardware and software between China and Russia. In general, the borders of trade open up between China and Russia and the 90s you see around 400 Russian firms move into China and you also get more energy based trade. As we know, Russia is a very important exporter of energy Um, They built a pipeline from Siberia to Shanghai to export oil and gas. Um, They also helped China to build several power plants in the northeast of the country as well. Here you see Russia trying to find other markets that are not just Europe. At this time, Europe is Russia's most important market for exporting energy, but we will see this shift in the coming decade. Moving on to the Hu Jintao era, The noughties is when you see this true turn to the east on behalf of Russia. This is also where Vladimir Putin comes into power in the early noughties. And this is where you start getting 
more public overtures f- between the two countries solidifying their relationship and saying to the world yes china and russia are indeed friends so you have putin saying things like russia and china are confidently maintaining a course towards building an equal and trusting partnership and this will become an important factor in maintaining global stability now this is like one of those nebulous fuzzy statements that doesn't really mean anything or say anything and this is quite um common in china that you get this sort of thing i don't know how common it is in russia where you have statements or you have documents that say like we're going to generally be more friendly but don't actually go into details about what that means on the ground but in general in the noughties you see that china and russia are making efforts to be friendlier towards each other so for example you have the 2005 peace mission In 2006, you have the year of China in Russia. And in 2007, you have the year of Russia in China. And then in 2009, you have the year of Russian language in China. And then in 2010, you have the year of Chinese language in Russia. So you get get the idea. Uh, They're making efforts in the cultural sphere, in the science and technology sphere, and having more exchanges. This is a lot more similar to what you saw in the 19th. 50s and not so much in the 1960s but in the early 1960s you did have more of these sort of cultural exchanges between the two countries as the basis of the general friendliness towards each other again the geopolitical situation particularly hostility towards the us is a very important factor in their friendship so in his 2000 essay russia new eastern perspectives Vladimir Putin says the following. Russia has always felt itself to be a Eurasian country. We have never forgotten that the main part of the Russian territory is in Asia. Frankly, we've not always made good use of that advantage. I think the time has come for us, together with the Asian Pacific countries, to move on from words to actions and to build up economic, political and other ties. Russia and China are firmly on a course to build an equal and trusting partnership which has become an important factor of global stability. The two countries go on to sign the Treaty of Good Neighbourliness and Friendly Cooperation in 2001. And this is sort of like a 20 year contract and it's actually been extended recently for another five years. And it's generally, again, this sort of fuzzy contract that doesn't really say a lot, but just says that we're gonna be nice to each other and we're gonna try and get along. And together we are going to back each other up when it comes to geopolitical issues and we're going to try and take each other's sides on that as much as possible particularly to stop the us from gathering all of its allies and imposing its own view on the world in general in this period you see a lot more attention being paid to china and russia's relationship it's very obvious that they're getting closer to one another and according to voskrensky again you see that analysts especially in russia fall into three main camps when talking about china and russia's relationship so he says russian analysts of china have fallen into three main camps optimists pessimists and pragmatists for all three groups the major question to answer has been whether russia could trust china as a reliable ally capable of helping russia not only to overcome its economic difficulties but also to construct a world and regional order beneficial to Russia's improved position in international affairs. All Russian analysts believed that a Russia-Chinese partnership at that time would help Russia rise without being subordinated to the US in an American-led world, while at the same time not becoming dependent on China. For the purposes of building up a strong anti-Westernism and anti-Americanism, certain segments of the Russian political elite agree even to subsume Russian greater power status in the international arena by making Russia subordinate to Chinese strategic, political and economic interests. So it's quite interesting that at this time people within Russia were even saying, well, maybe it's in Russia's best interest to, instead of building up our own economic might and fighting against, you know, West the Western economy or the Eurozone, actually to let China grow and to kind of latch onto what China's doing and be part of their economic growth and through that partnership come together and oppose Western hegemony. This isn't to say that Russia didn't see China as an ally or, you know, that the two trusted each other completely. There was obviously 
issues that most of the world had at this time of China outright copying a lot of the technology that Russia was supplying to them and trying to undermine Russian manufacturers and producers. There was also the issue of China becoming more influential in spheres where Russia typically had been the leader, places like uh, the North Korean peninsula, for example, but also things like Mongolia, Afghanistan, and the Middle East in general. And then you also have the issue of things like the Belt and Road, which it hasn't kicked off yet, but China is in general making economic inroads into Eurasia. Again, this is typically Russia's sphere of influence, especially in the former Soviet republics that have only recently, in historical terms, become independent. So to see them moving away from Russia would have been very difficult for a lot of people who would have, in a sort of colonialist way, seen those people as part of Russia's sphere of influence. There are some people who also argue that Russia actually didn't see China as that important at this time. Even though China's GDP was starting to hit double-digit growth figures, it's possible that Russia still saw China as sort of like a second class ally. So for example, Bobo Lo writes, The combination of historical fears and political civilizational stereotyping has reinforced an extant West centrism in both Russia and China. As a consequence, the strategic partnership carries the whiff of second class. This is especially true in Moscow, where relations with America, Western Europe, and the former Soviet Union absorb considerably more attention and resources. Such relativism detracts from the bilateral relationship in two ways. In the first place, it sometimes translates into a careless attitude towards the strategic concerns of the other. Second, Russia and China have, to some extent, become competitors for Western favour, whether in the form of foreign investment, political approbation, or advantageous security arrangements. So at that time, the question for Russia would have been, does a friendship or allyship with China outweigh the drawbacks of the situation, or should we be focusing more on our relationship with the West, trying to reconcile with the US, and trying to build up more favour with the European Union? I think time has answered that question. I think, you know, saying at the time, well, we're not so sure about how strong China's economy is going to be, or thinking at the time that Europe is more important economically than China is obviously a very early noughties perspective on the issue. I don't think nowadays anyone would make that argument. I think now the wind has blown very far in favour of China, even considering the sort of post-pandemic state of affairs. So we see the final and true pivot towards China in the Xi Jinping era. After 2013, when Xi Jinping sort of was fully in position as the apex of Chinese political power, you see a real shift in attitude in Russia towards China. And a lot of this has been put down to uh, Xi Jinping and Putin's personal relationship. Apparently, personal relations are very important to Putin. He views that as like one of the most important factors for building up political ties. And from my limited understanding of Russian politics, basically everybody in the sort of upper political and economic elite are some way connected to Putin, either, you know, financially or like they're close friends of his, basically. So in order to get on Russia's good side, you basically have to be on Putin's good side. In terms of Xi Jinping and Putin's relationship, the first time they met properly was at the Asia Pacific uh, Economic Cooperation Summit in 2013. And apparently they got on so well that Xi Jinping was invited to Putin's birthday party. That's nice for him. But I think in general, if you look at their leadership styles, they're very similar, right? They're probably the most similarly authoritarian and ideologically aligned leaders that both countries have seen for a long time. This has allowed them not only to set mutually beneficial goals, but also to approach strategic issues in the same way way. In his report on Russian-China relations after the 2014 Ukrainian crisis, Alexander Gabuev writes, quote, Boris Yeltsin's relationship with his Chinese counterpart Jiang Zemin was good. They spoke in Russian, which facilitated direct conversation, but the Russian president never called his co Chinese colleague a friend as he addressed former US President Bill Clinton and former Japanese Prime Minister Ryotaro Hashimoto. Putin's experience with Jiang was fruitful but brief. Both leaders managed to sign the 2001 Friendship Treaty, which paved the way for the settlement of Russian-Chinese border disputes. 
Jiang's successor, Hu Jintao, was 10 years older than Putin and unemotional. Xi has been very different from both his predecessors. Just six months younger than Putin, Xi could be described as the Russian president's soulmate, a strong leader with a vision of his country becoming a great power again. The two are clearly so close that it allows Putin to overlook certain issues such as the Belt and Road's prominence in uh, the Eurasian area. Putin has even discussed linking up parts of his own economic plan, which is the Eurasian Economic Union, which is kind of trying to create a single market in Armenia, Belarus, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan and Russia, and taking that and linking that up with the Belt and Road. They still have really high trade in things like natural resources, and China has actually recently replaced Germany as Russia's largest trading partner. However, many analysts are very quick to point out that the trade imbalance between the two countries is very, very big. <laughs> so lots of economic forecasters say that, well, the balance of power is so skewed that if China ever pulls the plug on Russia, they're going to be, you know, left adrift, which I guess is a high risk situation for Russia. But given that they've now been put under sanctions by the West, it kind of worked out in their favour, I would say. So instead of investing everything that they had into Europe, now they've been cut off from Europe, but they still have their own economic lifeline in China. So from Russia's perspective, this was probably actually a good thing. This is a very typical take from Western analysts, especially US analysts who tend to frame their analysis in terms of how does this affect the US? Are we going to have to go to war with somebody? They tend to portray the China-Russia relationship as an axis of convenience. So, for example, in their 2016 article, Moscow's Failed Pivot to China, Thomas Edda and Miko Hotari argue that Russia is basically trying to use China to circumvent uh, Western sanctions. So they write, What one finds time and time again with Sino-Russian cooperation are lofty announcements that fail to correspond with the reality of a less than robust relationship. As a result, the current state of Sino-Russian relations do little to provide Moscow with any geopolitical leverage against Europe. In fact, it's the other way around. Europe has been more successful at playing the diversification game, as well as attracting investments and increasing trade with China. So this is indeed a take, but I think this is a take that only really holds up if you see the relationship between China and Russia as necessarily quid pro quo, where everything has to be exchanged directly for something else. I think this is kind of a Western-centric way of viewing relations, whereas I think China and Russia are happy to keep it free and easy and based on sort of personal ties and personal relationship. In China, you also have this concept of guanxi, right? And that's also about um, the importance of personal relationships in maintaining mainly economic ties, but it can also be to do with your career, to do with politics, all sorts of things about getting ahead and, you know, getting on in the world. And I think that this is where Chinese and Russian political culture meets up quite nicely. And I don't think that it's something that Western observers of the two countries have really gotten to grips with, especially when you're talking about how Russian military strategists are viewing the relationship between the two countries. I think something that might be a problem for China and Russia in the future is what happens when the US is no longer an issue. That might put a dent in their relationship but I think for now the two are on fairly solid ground and it's only being strengthened by the fact that the US is becoming more antagonistic towards both parties both with the Russia-Ukrainian war and also with the US trying to orchestrate international sanctions against Chinese goods, Chinese investments, Chinese universities, Chinese researchers etc etc. There was actually an analysis of China-Russian communiques that was conducted looking at how their messages between each other since 2013 show that both parties are increasingly putting global issues at centre stage and opposing the Western-dominated status quo. According to authors of the report China and Russia United in Opposition, mentions of the US in Chinese-Russian statements were negligible under Jiang and Hu, but have rapidly increased since 2014, leading to an all-time high with the 2022 joint statement in which both sides identified the US as a security threat in Europe and the Indo-Pacific. 
Russia and China basically see the US through exactly the same lens or the world situation through the same lens, right? So I think it's important to note that when the US are writing about China and Russia, they are seeing an active threat. Ellings and Suter write that the drivers of Sino-Russian cooperation overshadow the brakes on forward movement at the US expense. This momentum is based on the common objectives and values, perceived Russian-Chinese vulnerabilities in the face of the US and Western pressures, and perceived opportunities for the two powers to expand their influence at the expense of the US and its allies that are seen in decline. The current outlook is bleak, offering no easy fixes, for the US. The chapters of this volume support multi-year and wide-ranging domestic and international strengthening of the US military, economic and diplomatic position to better situate the US to deal with the challenges from China and Russia. In summary, all sides are seeing each other very antagonistically and a kind of, well I think actually you could argue Russia and China understand the US better than the US understands China and that's why when it comes to the US panicking about China jumping into the fray, I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about that relationship. I think casting Russia and China as this sort of friends with benefits and there's no real basis of their relationship doesn't really hold water. I think they've set up enough... Um, I think there's enough history there. There's enough between them and there's enough personal relationship. There's enough ties they've deliberately intertwined themselves in a way that allows them to take a step back and not necessarily have to jump in and fight if the other's fighting but at the same time china can say things like you know we expect we respect every country's right to sovereignty but we also think it's wrong that the us is imposing sanctions on russia and we're not going to do that so they're there to kind of lick each other's wounds and hold the other one up when the other one is down they're kind of friends with each other, but not really friends with anyone else, if that makes sense. Like, they don't have the same friendship groups. <laughs> they're just, they're like the friends who are outside of school and just know each other. If that, I don't know if that makes sense as an analogy. But basically, they have their own private relationship. The West, the US, and the rest don't really understand it that well. And I think that at least as long as they remain common enemies, with the US, that relationship is going to be just fine, even if it doesn't lead to China and Russia coming to pick up arms and fight other countries on their behalf. But they might give them weapons. I don't know the answer to that question. We'll just have to wait and see. So that's it for this episode, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget to head over to Substack and subscribe to the Sinobabel newsletter, where I talk about modern day news, politics, culture, etc. My most recent newsletter was a news roundup of all the interesting stories I read in China this week. I tend to find that kind of thing interesting and so you can head over there and read that if you so wish. You can also go over to buy me a coffee, the link is in the description. Every donation that you give helps to support the show or if you're listening on a podcast player there should be a support the show button so give a donation if you want, if not you can keep on listening for free. Thanks very much guys and I'll see you in the next episode.